Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, thank you for joining this session of our ILS Asia 2020 conference. Um, thank you to anybody who dialed in earlier today um, for a fantastic panel discussion about parametric risk transfer. Um, this is our first sort of keynote with slides of the event. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome Paul Schultz, CEO of Aon Securities. Um, he's going to be giving a keynote on ILS in Asia, its history, the current market, and future outlook as well. Um, Paul's unit and team at Aon Securities are intrinsically involved in the origination, structuring, arranging, distribution of ILS, ranging from catastrophe bonds to reinsurance sidecars, other collateralized reinsurance arrangements as well. Also heavily involved in the capital raising and investment banking side of reinsurance in general. Um, and has a long history in the ILS space and has probably been involved or touched on as many transactions as anybody else, particularly in the cap bond market, I would say. Um, Paul's going to present his keynote, after which we'll have time for some questions and answers as well. Um, please do submit your questions in the box in the interface in front of you. Um, we'll get to these at the end of the presentation. Um, if you want to resize the video window or the slides that you see in front of you, you can do. Um, and I hope you enjoy this and uh, make the most of hearing from one of the uh, sort of longest standing executives in the ILS industry. So, Paul, welcome. And uh, I'll just hand over to you. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, look forward to at some point getting back to Singapore and, and having this uh, more of a physical in-person discussion than, than virtual, but uh, appreciate the opportunity. And uh, and certainly, uh, you know, good to connect with a lot of you. Uh, it's been a couple of years since since I've been in Singapore um, and participated in this conference, but uh, we're gonna use a lot of the same slides um, that we used last time, just to kind of build on the story, kind of show continuity, show where there's been um, some development and things like that. So as Steve noted, uh, really focused, you know, a little bit. So just touch briefly on kind of what's happened just to set the tone and, and use that to inform um, kind of how we think about expectations going forward a little bit more about the current market and kind of we'll take a little bit of liberty and go uh, maybe uh, do some adjacencies here a little bit in that discussion. And then uh, hopefully have, you know, some perspective on, on what can happen and, and what we might expect you know, in the future um, coming out of Asia, Asia Pacific more broadly around ILS. So with that, we'll jump right into, into the history. Um, kind of a busy slide and, and uh, you know, kind of given our role in, in the industry, we're happy that it's a busy slide. So I think, uh, you know, a couple takeaways, you know, from this, and this is, this is predominantly a, a cap on slide. Um, you'll note that uh, where we have uh, included kind of sidecar transactions, uh, you know, those are specifically kind of labeled as such in this in this uh, slide. But when you just look at, you know, the slide in its totality and, and really think about the years kind of 2000 to 2010, so that 10 year period, and then you contrast that with the activity over the last 10 years, You'll see here. Uh, you can just see it by by the number of transactions. But if you were to count those up, you know the the increase has been more than twofold in in the last ten years. And I, I think that really sets the stage for kind of what we would expect in in the future. Um, and as I said, you know, given where we sit, um, that that two times multiple on it, um, you know, is exciting, and, and we're certainly happy to be part of it. I think other takeaways here is that. Clearly, ILS has been embedded, you know, with with a few sponsors, and, and given kind of the repeat nature of of transactions here, and, and the names and the sponsors and things like that, you know, we think that that's very healthy, which just shows that ILS has become, you know, kind of a foundational, uh, you know, form of risk transfer um, for for sponsors and and seedants in the region, and we look basically you know, to replicate that with others as we grow the market going forward. The third point, which, you know, we'll, we'll touch a little bit on as we go through the entire presentation, but, you know, not particularly evident on this slide is but that we, we've used different features, different structural features um, across this timeline. Um, certainly as you go back to the early days, but even, you know, in the last 10 years, 
what we find is that um, even repeat sponsors have changed the way that they issue into the market. So taking advantage of the structural flexibility that exists and kind of using that structural flexibility to solve for, for different types you know, of solutions that, that uh, sponsors and, and uh, students are looking for. Um, clearly the introduction of new perils. And so, you know, we have China and Philippines kind of represented in the last few years and then new, new domiciles. So kind of all of that is, is really setting the stage for, for how we think about, uh, you know, the market and kind of the opportunities going forward. Uh, we would like to highlight kind of what we think is is one of the, the largest success stories in, in Asia, and by the way, kind of one of the largest success stories um, in, in kind of the ILS market kind of globally. Um, so Zenkirin is the, the second largest sponsor of, of cat bonds globally, uh, obviously the, the largest in, in Asia. I've been active for more than 15 years, and so um, really a testament to kind of the longevity of the markets, uh, kind of the, the, the innovation or the pioneering um, kind of effort that, that, that Zankiran kind of launched this effort back in, in 2003. Um, note that there is a recovery. And so as you look at look to the, the green numbers on the slides, obviously you can see that in 2003, Zank started by issuing, you know, kind of call it uh, approximately 500 million and a recovery in 2011. And so, you know, one of the things that we keep looking for are the proof points that the market is, is working as expected. And, you know, given the, you know, the large earthquake event in 2011, if for some reason there wouldn't have been a recovery, that, that would have obviously been, you know, defining point in, in the history of this. Uh, but I, I would say kind of worked as expected, kind of a, a proof point there. And then growing, you know, really then over the last 10 years, um, you know, from the relatively small amounts of notional put into the market to, you know, approximately $2 billion today. So all of that, you know, kind of, um, you know, really important uh, for the development, uh, at, you know, as a leader in the space, as a development of the market over this period of time. And again, you can see a few of the structural comments here that I mentioned in the prior slide, but you know, the, the range of issuance included second event cover, parametric cover, moving to indemnity structures, um, moving to annual aggregate, and, and then moving to sort of a multi-year kind of aggregate growth. So um, very flexible in the way that um, Securin has embraced this market, and certainly from the from the investor side, uh, the fact that they've been able to grow with Zinc and, and their needs and, and, and desires to, to kind of grow this market, support the market's been been very impressive over the last 15 years. Okay, so with that backdrop then, uh, what I would like to move into is just kind of, how do we think about the current market? And and here, um, you, you, kind of, you can kind of read those numbers and, and I, I won't necessarily you know, call out all of them, but the importance of, of Asia Pacific you know, for global GDP is, is obvious. Um, it's going to be important. It's, it is important today. Definitively, it's going to be more important as we look forward. So, you know, the current market is that, you know, this, this technology, if you will, this capital, the way that we innovate around it and, and sort of even have an ESG sort of agenda here, all sort of very critical as we think about just Asia PAC as, as we move forward. When you look at 2019, uh, what we've tried to do here is, is highlight the, the types of perils uh, affecting, or at least in, in a major or significant way, the types of perils affecting um, Asia and Asia Pacific more, broad, more broadly. Um, and then on the right, you can certainly see a positively sloped kind of uh, loss picture as, as we move over the last you know, sort of 20 years. And the, the perils that we, would certainly highlight for this for this region, you know, obviously tropical cyclone and, and flooding are, are sort of driving the losses on a consistent basis. I and mean, when you look at the the size of the bubbles, if you will, and, and in terms of the, the catastrophe events, you know, obviously those are, are critical and need to have solutions uh, in, in the marketplace. Moving to the next slide, um, again, this is a slide that I, I, I talked about it a few years ago, but but really the protection gap um, exists globally. Um, 
and, and there's a stark reality between kind of what what is insured and what is uninsured. And in, in Asia Pac, that protection gap is, is even slightly worse than than what it is globally. So, um, in my opinion, in our firm's opinion, this just isn't a sustainable kind of outcome. And as we as we overlay kind of the current economic situation, you know, the, the realities of, of COVID nineteen, uh, the impacts economically to to businesses to to insurers, to reinsurers, to to countries, um, uh, to, you know, to governments, it, it, the the economic toll is going to be massive. And, and then to have, you know, this type of protection gap where natural catastrophe risk uh, is, you know, the, the take up rate um, is not that impressive um, when you just look at over over this twenty year period of time. You look at the, you know, kind of the trend of of insured versus uninsured, you know, that just isn't sustainable. So, um, and, and, then, and then on top of this, you have kind of year over year uh, deterioration between 18 and 19. Um, and so this really creates the opportunity for us all. And so when we talk about an impact and we talk about what we can do in the markets, I, I don't think there's really a better slide that sort of highlights the opportunity. Um, but, but ILS, I think is, uh, you know, clearly the type of product that can come in and have a significant impact. We'll talk about some of the efforts you know, recently that, that sort of fit along this uh, this description. Um, but I would just say ILS and, and broadly the capital markets are going to have to be an instrumental part of, of the way we solve this. And I think there's never been a more important time to just really step back and say, you know, kind of what are we doing to promote sustainability? What, what are we doing in the region? Um, to kind of address this issue because clearly uh, the stress in the system, if you will, it exists even more today than it, than it has, um, you know, looking backwards. Okay, uh, you know, we, we would be remiss if, if we didn't in the, in the current market sort of talk about what's happening in, uh, in domiciles. So, um, you know, the, the ability to kind of support and facilitate um, ILS issuance in the region Kind of a busy slide here, um, and you know I, I won't kind of read all these numbers, but you know we've seen uh, Bermuda and Cayman, uh, with, with with Bermuda sort of being the more active of the two, but really kind of the dominant domiciles over time. Um, and you and when you look through this, if you just look at the key in the blue, you can kind of see what all of these figures mean. But not only do we show the number of transactions and the notional limits sort of put to those domiciles. But we also talk about, if you will, the, the efficiency of the system. So, you know, how how long does it take to to kind of put these transactions in place? You know, get them established. And when you look at Bermuda and Cayman, for instance, and you compare that to to kind of the others, you know, clearly it's it's an efficient process. It works. Um, but you know, the attractiveness of of the other domiciles is that it's it's more local, and and we'll you know, certainly hit on that. As we move forward into kind of what what can come next, but the importance of domiciles, uh, I don't think, can be understated. It, it facilitates issuance, it makes it more local, and things like that. And and really, you know, as we look at what's happened in the UK and what's happened in in, in Singapore, uh, specifically in this region, I, I think you can really say it's uh, there's been some progress there, and and at the end of the day, is going to. Uh, help facilitate you know growth in these markets and an important part of the considerations. And specifically on Singapore, then what we've what we've highlighted here is just uh, you know the, the the transactions that have been issued using Singapore as a domicile. Um, interestingly, I don't think we would have thought about this a, a few years ago, but interestingly, a lot of the issuance comes out of North America, which. Um, I'm not sure it was the intent uh, of it, but you know, for Singapore to facilitate you know, global uh, transactions, I think that obviously is a success story. Um, but I think the skew towards North America is kind of an interesting observation. We're obviously very pleased that that Japan is represented in this, um, and, and obviously MSI, you know, issued their transaction this year. I think important for the region. Um, and then when we look to um, IAG kind of being the first to to issue out of it, you know, it's 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 good to see Asia and Pacific kind of broadly represented here. 
but you know, looking forward, you know, th this I think is going to have to uh, sort of grow in the region. Probably making an obvious statement, but uh, you know, obviously it's great that it's a global hub and can attract issuance, um, you know, from different parts of the world. But but really, you know, the, the local attractiveness of Singapore I think is is going to be important, um, you know, for for those in Asia um, looking forward. Okay, um, just kind of giving a, a very brief uh, bond market update. Um, well, again, kind of a busy slide, um, but we'll look to the bottom left of this slide to start with. And, and here are just some statistics, which I think in some way uh, capture the activity over the past couple of years, you know, pretty well. And the, you know, the top row of, uh, of data represents year to date or the first half of, of 2020 and, and the bottom part 2019. So when you look through this, you know, really kind of by all metrics here, um, whether that's the, the number of transactions completed, whether that's the, the number of distinct sponsors kind of accessing the market in the first half of 20, um, the amount of issuance, um, and, and even slightly the, the average deal size, you can see that 2020 year to date has, has clearly outperformed 2019. A lot of issues around 2019, which you know, sort of explain that. Um, but but rather started getting into that. Just thinking about 2020, I think it's even a little bit more impressive, kind of given you know, kind of what happened in in the middle of of the you know first half of the year. Obviously, the impacts of, of COVID-19, uh, the broader impacts within you know the global financial markets, uh, the fact that um, ILS traded and held you know, fair value, if you will, or good value throughout um, the process really demonstrates the non-correlation um, argument that you know, has brought investors into the space. There are a number of very important uh, kind of distinctive marks that we've um, sort of passed again as an industry in the first half of the year, and then having the issuance level that we did, you know, kind of very important. I would note that when we look at the average deal size, that, that's obviously trended down over the past couple of years. Um, you know, that was a, a number that would have been higher if we just looked at this in 2017 and 2016 as an example. Um, you know, something that you know we're obviously cognizant of, um, but but still, you know, meaningful issue in size, uh, you know, per transaction, and, and, and as noted in the Zankiran case study. You know, obviously, the, the way that you build capacity, if, if you're looking for a significant capacity over time, is to have multiple issuance over a, a short period of time. And then, um, you know, also call out the the amount of, of of regional representation, if you will, in terms of the coverage of these of these bonds. So not only for uh, you know Asian issuers, but also for other issuers that include Asian exposures and, and kind of what they're covering in the market. Um, the APAC region accounting for 15% of, of the to total emotional amount of standing. So as we, as we just step back and, and think about that, that in itself is, 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 is good. You know, for a diversifying part of the market, I think that that's a healthy number. Um, certainly has, has grown over the years. Uh, but I think when we then put that into perspective of kind of where kind of the growth and where kind of GDP is in the world, probably still underestimates the potential um, that exists in this region, and and and, uh, and and I'll talk about that a bit more. The, uh, the the plots above just kind of give an indication, if you will, kind of where where the bonds have traded in the market. You know, probably you know another discussion, but you can see kind of the the dispersion of, of activity in, in, in twenty versus uh, versus nineteen. Okay, um, we have a couple case studies in here. The, the first, I think, is is very relevant to kind of some of the comments we just made. Um, so, uh, the first is uh, you know the, the Philippines cap bond that was issued. Obviously, the first cap bond issued out of Philippines. Um, the non indemnity nature of the transaction is highlighted in the notes below. Kind of a model loss transaction. Um, you know, the, the World Bank made a few comments on the closure of this transaction and, and perhaps already covered in, in the World Bank discussion. Um, but obviously, many countries in Asia are highly vulnerable to natural disasters. I think Philippines is, is certainly one of those countries. Um, and, 
and important of note, probably you know, equally as important and, and looking forward, probably more important, you know, the first uh, the first bond to be sponsored by uh, the government of, a, of an Asian country. So as, as we look to the future of ILS in Asia and we think about kind of where the protection gap is and we think about sort of how uh, we're going to close that and kind of where the opportunity is and kind of where the risk in the system is, if you will, I think, I think governments are going to have to be um, larger contributors to this market. I think that's where the opportunity is, um, you know, really exists. Um, and so, you know, good focus on this. I think this is a, a great case study and and sort of how it was used uh, by, the, by the Treasury of the Philippines and of how the trigger was customized to kind of what uh, what, what the Philippines you know, wanted and needed out of this market, um, and so the cooperation of kind of all the parties to get that done. The uh, the graphic on the bottom is just uh, is just an illustration, you know, not so much specific to Philippines, but obviously the use of non indemnity triggers does have some benefit in terms of recovery time. Um, uh, you know, kind of as noted in the earlier case study, um, you know, Zenk. Uh, Used a parametric trigger, and when they recovered in in the in the Great East uh, Tohoku earthquake, uh, parametric triggers, model loss triggers, you know those index triggers, really all of those have a benefit when it comes to recovery time. Um, as we think about sort of the sustainability of economies and so forth, you know that recovery speed is important, and, and as a result, I think. The non-indemnity nature of these transactions um, will be something that will be replicated as as we move forward. Just uh, moving to to sidecars briefly, um, the, uh, the the graph on the bottom would just show kind of the, the market capitalization or market capacity of sidecars over over the you know the last uh, fifteen or so years. Um, you can see that there is certainly a period of time where issuance is more elevated than, than others. This is a global perspective, so much like the, the global perspective on, on cap bonds, global perspective on sidecars. Would note that this, this marketplace um, is a little bit a little bit more distressed or a little bit distressed, uh, certainly on a relative basis to the, to the cap bond market. Terms and conditions, capacity really under pressure. Um, uh, I, I would just say that this is predominantly based on sort of investor preferences. Um, you know, the, the fact that there's a greater demand, uh, if you will, uh, by investors for more liquid products um, ha has really, you know, taken an, a toll or an impact on this market. Um, would note that. Those with proven track records, so those that have sponsored, you know, sidecars in the past, I think, continue to execute successfully. Newer sponsors, you know, especially in, in, the, in the last 12 months, um, have have kind of fallen short of, of of target capacity raises. Some have even pulled transactions. So it, it's it's a it's a more difficult marketplace. You could argue it's a little bit more strategic marketplace, and so the importance of it, you know, still is there. Uh, but a little bit more thought and, and execution, a little more strategy around execution, you know, really critical to, to executing sidecars going forward. And then what, what I would highlight is that sort of differentiated portfolios, differentiated model outcomes, um, geographically diversifying perils uh, really um, are attractive. And so I think the, the reason we sort of bring sidecars into this discussion, even though you know, Asia Pac is is not terribly represented well with the number of sidecar transactions. Is the opportunity for those that have distinctive portfolios that sort of meet these criteria? I think is is actually you know quite good and quite strong. And so, uh, I think it's important for this region as we think about other ways of bringing risk that you know sits in the region out of it into into the investor community. You know, this clearly has to be a tool. Um, as we move forward. And then, you know, to, to add a case study to, to sidecars, uh, we wanted to highlight the, uh, the first sidecar done, really the, the, the only sidecar done in Asia, uh, sponsored by Peak Re. 
Um, so this is this transaction has been out in the marketplace for a couple of years. You'll notice on the bottom of the slide that you know, in, in our view, that this has been a, a very successful transaction executed in what we're calling difficult market conditions. You know, it's just highlighted on the on the on the prior page. Um, sponsored uh, with a very diverse portfolio in terms of geography, in terms of the risk makeup. Um, and I think the, the, the nature of the underwriting and, and the quality of the sponsor has really brought investors in, into this transaction. Um, when you look at some, some of the key terms, you'll look at some of the things like subject business and, and things like that, which really differentiate the portfolio, kind of if you go back to the prior slide, you know, sort of differentiated model outcomes or actual results and differentiated portfolio, clue this fits into that. So um, I think the, the, the last point on the page, where there's an opportunity for investors to diversify into risks that just can't be easily achieved through other mechanisms or other types of products, um, you know, I think this is a uh, you know great way for for sponsors to come into the market, and we would actually expect there to be you know significant growth opportunities for for sidecar opportunities um, that that come out of Asia looking forward. And I think Peak has set you know a good example for how that can can move forward as well. Okay, so you know with with a with that sort of backdrop on history and kind of where the market sits. Um, and I've already sort of hinted to some of the, you know, the, you know, where this may bring us into the marketplace, kind of just want to jump right into it. So the, uh, the, the size of the hex guns here probably indicate, you know, our view of the opportunity and, and really uh, we're going to say that the domicile expansion is an important part um, of the growth in this market. Obviously Singapore, um, had leadership in, in this region, I think has benefited from that, um, if not from as much issuance out of the region as may be anticipated a few years ago, certainly has benefited and led the way and, and set the example and the model for other uh, domiciles um, you know, to, to, to grow in the region. Uh, certainly government sponsors of bonds and, and uh, you know, we've inserted the word parametric, but it's really, the government sponsors of bonds that I think will will, will be a, a core source of opportunities for ILS looking forward. Parametric um, offers some opportunities to go into 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 some geographies or some types of transactions that that maybe aren't available through other through other types or other forms of triggers. And so we've highlighted the parametric nature of the opportunity. And then um, and then kind of secondary sources still important though. Um, we see kind of expansion of ILS, and that expansion would be through perils, you know, through structures, through geographies, through types of sponsors, um, you know, kind of all of that would, would qualify under kind of the expansion. Um, as we move into to weather products, um, obviously we just had a parametric panel, um, the, the weather products, you know, important to the region, just kind of given the nature of the perils um, and, and, and some of the, the, the demographics and things like that. And then, as highlighted um, with the, the Peakery case, uh, we think there's an opportunity um, for sidecars for the sponsors that, that that are able to bring that risk profile and that you know differentiated performance um, to the marketplace. Okay, so let's so let's touch on domicile expansion briefly. Um, I think the the donuts on the right, you know, just graphically shows the the numbers that were were shown um, on the prior slide on domicile. Um, obviously, the, you know, the, the, the two parts of that donut, the Bermuda and Cayman, they sort of dominate this. Um, but, you know, significant and important parts of, um, you know, contributions from others. Would note that um, on the bottom left, um, as we think about opportunities for, for Asia Pacific, um, this notion of being able to be more local, to be more regional, uh, to you know, for for sponsors and and seedings to be able to trade in in the markets that they're most comfortable trading in, you know, we think is a, a real key to kind of unlock um, some of the growth opportunities in Asia Pacific and and, and Singapore and, and 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 we'll talk about Hong Kong in the next slide, 
um, you know, important considerations as we just think about how we're going to be able to unlock more opportunities um, in, in Asia. You know, some of the challenges are, and, and you can certainly see that by, uh, as you reflect on that prior slide on domicile, some of the challenges around uh, having the local expertise and, and, and having that grow with the, the transactions that get done, having the speed to uh, basically affect efficient transactions, kind of, those are certainly challenges. I think they're, they're very solvable. Um, and, and I think we'll, you know, as, as more volume, if you will, more transactions, you know, come into the market, that expertise will grow pretty quickly. And so I think there'll be a way to catch up. But initially, it's just, uh, you know, it's just part of the transaction that everyone needs to understand and take into account. Um, but, but clearly, um, you know, less efficient initially, but that efficiency um, can grow over time. And then, you know, specifically uh, uh, on this page, kind of highlight Hong Kong. So I think Hong Kong is an important, uh, you know, domicile, and they're clearly in, in the stages of, of getting there and, and not quite there yet. Um, but we think that would be an, an also a very integral or important part of the market um, in Asia. And so we we're looking forward to that coming online. And then the ability to, to put more products through through the market. So we've highlighted you know, sidecars, you know, again, consistent with the opportunity of, of sidecar opportunity or sidecar you know, potential growth in, in, in Asia. Um, so, you know, Singapore's reimbursement or expense reimbursement, you know, part of the equation has been very important in attracting uh, issuers into the region. Um, obviously, I think as we broaden out or potentially broaden out the types of products that can be put you know, through that domicile, also very important for Singapore, or Hong Kong, or just you know, any type of the uh, you know, domiciles in, in the region. Okay, um, highlight, we've highlighted the nature of non-indemnity or parametric bonds already a few times, so, so don't wanna dwell too much on that. Uh, what, would highlight, what I would highlight here is just kind of the rationale for you know, the non-indemnity approach. And, and one is simplicity. So ease of transaction, speed of transaction, um, not necessarily having to worry about data quality as much as you might through other types of triggers. Uh, and, and it's a way to kind of start to understand um, how this market works how the benefits of the risk transfer capacity that come, can, can come from ILS markets um, can be brought uh, to the benefit of, of the sponsor. Uh, it's transparent. I think it's, it's you know, relatively simple to, to describe, relatively simple to understand you know, for all the constituents. Um, there is efficiency in the, the recovery process, the payment speed, but there's also efficiency around disaster relief. So, the flexibility to kind of use any proceeds that come from a parametric style or non-indemnity style transaction are just inherently uh, more broad than they would be with, with a, an indemnity type of purchase. And so being able from a government perspective to, to be able to use those for different constituencies and, and be able to sort of make sure that, that that those funds are available for any type of disaster relief. I think the, the efficiency around that is certainly greater with a, with a parametric approach. Um, and then, as I noted, just the, the either the, the lack of data quality or the hard to insure perils. You know, I think there's, there's certainly been evidence of more creativity around triggers, the acceptance of those triggers in the marketplace, and, and certainly look for more of that as we move forward you know, getting back to this notion of we just have to do a better job collectively. We all have to own the importance of, of solving that protection gap because you know, clearly the economic scenario where we are in for a while is not, is not conducive for having you know, greater net retention around natural disasters as they happen in Asia. The case study that has already been highlighted, so I won't spend too much time on it, uh, the Muteki bond issued by, by Zenk. Um, you know, based on uh, peak ground acceleration uh, from more than a thousand observation stations. Um, obviously there was a recovery has been noted in the prior slide around the, the Great East Japan earthquake, um, you know, clearly uh, exceeded kind of the, the, the index value. This clearly exceeded the, the attachment point. 
um, and then a fairly rapid uh, recovery once once the transaction happens. So, and it, again, proof of concept, which we certainly like um, those those data points as we as we try and grow this market and can demonstrate that you know the transactions have worked as advertised. And then as we think about public sector or governments or ho however you want to think state sovereigns, whatever, whatever sort of terminology you want to use here. Um, you know, clearly the, the World Bank has, uh, you know, been an integral part of, of the sponsoring of some of these transactions that we've highlighted um, here. At least the first example is the the uh, the IBRD issuance that covered Latin America countries. So the the the, the coverage isn't necessarily relative, uh, or, or you know, that isn't an Asian based uh, coverage. But I think the the concept that was used here having several countries participate in a sponsored transaction, certainly meaningful capacity, um, the largest ever sovereign risk insurance transaction, the second largest cap bond ever. I mean, th those are, you know, those are very important data points. Um, obviously, proof of concept through a recovery through through a Peru, the Peru bond. And again, all these data points are helpful. And then, and then obviously, the Philippines, you know, followed with, with the issuance that, that they did. So, World Bank has been been uh, an important part of this. I think will continue to be an important part of this, um, but effectively a call out to others in that regard uh, as we look forward. And then, you know, on that theme, um, you know, just listed another example. So we've listed the uh, Asian Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation or APEC. Um, so we've listed or we've shown the, the 21 member economies kind of listed below. Um, APAC was formed in 1989. You can see the, the, their comments about accessing the capital markets to, to secure disaster risk transfer and financing. Um, you know, the mandate of APAC is to promote free trade and sustainable development. Kind of, again, never a more relevant time um, for that sustainability around uh, economies and around development uh, to, be, to be called out. Um, when you look at sort of the APEC countries, the APEC economies, um, they account for more than 60% of the global GDP. So obviously, you know, pretty important. Some of this, you know, some of some of the covers, for instance, out of, out of North America, you know, more that are available today. But but when you look, you know, look to the east, um, you know, certainly less. Uh, but it, kind of an interesting data point as well is more than 70% of all natural disasters come out of the APEC countries or APEC economies. So, um, as we focus efforts on sort of how you know, how we can use entities like this, um, you know, we just wanted to call this one out as an example for some sort of regional advocacy. Um, there are many more. We could have had you know whole whole slide deck on, on the types of institutions that can promote sort of the state or sovereign or government approach here. Um, but you know, just another example of sort of a stated intent to do it. And now, sort of up to the industry to sort of find ways uh, to enable that and, and to make that happen. And then, what I'd like to uh, to close with is just a um, a view around opportunity. And uh, rather than you know, that hopefully you know, some of the thoughts here have been provoking and, and intriguing about where growth can come from. But as we just look at the deployment of capital in, in Asia Pacific. You know, pretty pretty good growth story over over the last uh, you know sort of 20 years and a nine percent compounded uh, growth rate. And that in itself, I think, is 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 very interesting and compelling and and highlights the importance of of Asia to the to the ILS world. But you know, for us, we're just sort of scratching the surface, at least from our perspective. When you when you step back, take a look at all the macro trends. When you look at some of the opportunities. When you take a look at the the current state of, of economies and, and sort of the prospects over the next couple of years because of the impact of COVID-19 and things like that. Um, never more important to sort of focus on this. And as we look at the opportunities over the next five years, you know, we actually think uh, that the growth rate um, should and, and will be higher higher than what we've seen in the past. So our, our outlook for the region is extremely bullish. Um, and uh, and hopefully for all the the reasons that we've outlined, you know that makes sense to you as well. Um, but having you know those of you that are dialed in, listening, and those of you that you know can 
can can move the domicile discussion. Those of you that can influence, you know, the the governmental and other types of of sponsorship, you know, really critical part of the whole equation. Okay, so I, th I think I've used up my time, Steve. Um, thanks, thanks for the opportunity, and, and happy to take any, any questions. Paul, thank you. Um, that, was, that was a very interesting speech. Sorry, we've got a bit of feedback going on there. Hopefully that will resolve itself in a moment. Yeah, there we go. Um, thank you, Paul. Really appreciate that. Um, very interesting insights, um, very helpful for people watching, I'm sure. Um, just a reminder to those who are watching that you can now submit your questions through the uh, Q&A box on the screen in front of you. Please do, and um, we'd appreciate some questions for Paul. Um, but I thought to start with, you highlighted um, APAC as roughly 15% of current cap on notional. Um, how, how does that compare to percent of cat exposed limit? I mean, I'm, I'm not expecting you to have numbers, but in terms of your view, is that actually a reasonable percentage for the cat bond market, um, or would you would you expect that to continue to grow, given the um, the penetration rates increasing in Asia? Yeah, I, I think I would expect that to grow over time. And if you've looked at the history of the way that's developed, you know, clearly we've seen growth over time. You know, to get to the 15% figure we're at today, um, but fundamentally, you know, the when you just look at the take-up rate, I think when you look at the take-up rate, you, you have to be a little bit of a, alarmed about sort of the the insured versus uninsured um, penetration. And and again, I just don't think that's sustainable. So when when economies are stressed and things like that, this is actually, you know. A very important part of not only sort of the sustainability of it, but but the re rebuilding of these economies to have these types of facilities in place, and any type of major catastrophe coming in on the heels of COVID, or as we maybe aren't even out of the first wave yet, um, you know, would, would be would be very costly. So we expect that to to grow over time, but it's it's going to be because take up rate is as small as it is, it's going to have to be really driven by entities that have, haven't participated as much in the ILS market as, as others today. Sure. And I guess also on the education of potential sponsors as well. Um, so for your team, I mean, do you, do you spend a lot of time trying to educate sponsors across the Asia region? And do you find the education process is perhaps a little bit slower there because it's a little bit further behind still? Uh, so, so great point. And um, obviously, we're, we're kind of living a new world today and how we sort of educate and, and a little bit more challenging, you know, without without some of the, uh, the ability to travel and things like that. But um, I, I would I would say it is a, a little bit slower, you know, probably do just, you know, to to a thoughtful, methodical approach here and uh, you know, thorough review and, and, and sort of culturally, all those are very important to, to the constituents in that region. And so we, we fully endorse that. It, it takes some time, it takes some education, um, but that's, you know, that, that's something that's been happening for a while. Um, but I think, you know, kind of given, given those years of education, kind of given where we sit today, it, it feels like, you know, now is the time, you know, to sort of get a little bit of action around that. But I think, you know, culturally, you know, there's a very methodical approach here in the region, and, and we fully support that. Um, I think there's been some education that will require more, and, and we'll find creative ways of educating, you know, remotely. But um, I, I think uh, I think there's been sufficient education to, to you know, that in the next few, in, in the next short period of time, whether that means, you know, the immediate 12 months or uh, a few years, you know, we should see, we should see more issuance out of the region. Great. Um, go to some questions now from the audience. Um, we've got one um, which discusses the fact that ILS has helped to transform sort of insurance and reinsurance as a flexible way for capital to enter the business, especially over the last decade. Um, but do you think that ILS participation is going to be able to continue to expand despite the recent hiccup following COVID-19 and the chokehold that's put on some funds and some sources of capital? 
Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And, um, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about it. I, I think there are several fundamental reasons that, you know, we, we will answer yes and be very bullish about that response. Um, I think principally we, we've demonstrated the, the non-correlation again. And so, the, as I keep saying, you know, repetition around proof points, you know, that, that, that proof point is very helpful. Um, and, you know, as, as the broader financial markets saw the volatility, you know, that they saw, you know, ILS again sort of you know, traded well throughout that period of time. When we get back to the founding principles of why ILS exists, that, that is certainly one of those. And so I think that, you know, the fact that we've been able to demonstrate that again, um, uh, I think is a helpful data point. So. So we do anticipate, you know, capital coming in. We we don't uh, we don't really see, uh, we haven't seen, you know, sort of fundamental exits or withdrawals. You know, certainly there's there's been some of that, and uh, and, and more focused on, uh, you know, some particular types of capital that have entered the system more so than a a you know exit decision around ILS asset costs uh, entirely. But when you when you match up against kind of the uh, the longer term investors that are investing through cycles and things like that, I think the non performance is important. I would say just a couple points on that. So, one is as an industry, we need to keep pushing for transparency. I, I can't underestimate the importance of transparency here. Um, and, and that's fundamentally going to be important, uh, you know, to, to the way this market performs over time. Um, and then, you know, we just have to keep pushing ourselves on, on sort of the the way that we look at the risk and make sure that you know we're capturing that that perspective about risk accurately and and you know as part of that transparency discussion, um, as long as we can we can demonstrate that we we are capturing the risk you know the, the the picture of that risk you know well, transparent about it can keep demonstrating the the type of non correlation that we have. I think all that is is fundamentally going to help the market grow. Great, thank you. Um, so, another question from the audience: um, With flooding being such a significant peril across the APAC region, and um, thinking back in particular to the Thai floods, um, sort of two thousand eleven, twelve, do you see any prospects for more corporate sponsors of cat bonds, or for flood cat bonds in particular? I know we've seen some some flood peril covered in Japanese transactions in the past, but is that something you could envisage seeing more broadly? Yeah, I, I, so, so yes, I, I think so. Um, I would say on the on the type of sponsor, I, I know I kind of covered that pretty quickly, but we, we think that, that corporate sponsors, um, you know, government types of sponsors, really the getting away from the traditional sponsors of cap bonds really being insurance companies and reinsurers, we think that that's a very, you know, reasonable growth expectation, not only in Asia but sort of globally. That that more, you know, sort of different types and more types of sponsors will come to the market, and so we see corporates and governments as kind of well represented in that. So, absolutely, I think we're going to see, you know, for the reasons of you know diversification, which are important to insurers and reinsurers to to access the, the capital markets. We think that diversification argument and the flexibility around structure. So can't underestimate. Can you know state that enough? The the flexibility around you know, creating innovative structures that kind of react a little bit differently. I think will will be important. And then the flood peril itself. I mean, flood is is obviously uh, a, a less modeled peril than, than some of the other perils in, in the marketplace is certainly less modeled than some of the other peak perils, put it that way. Um, and so we just need to make sure that as, as we continue to expand the, the flood coverage in ILS, that we have a you know fundamental understanding of kind of what that risk profile looks like. But I think it, when we just look at that peril, especially you know tie flooding as an example, Having government participation, having ILS participation, and having broader capital market participation, I think all sort of integral you know, to solving that equation um, and coming together as an industry to make sure we really understand the risk there. I think you know, if we do that, I think we can put in place sustainable you know, coverage for flooding and you know, in this case specifically tie flooding. 
Mm. I guess it, it, it's also interesting how those um, tie floods also showed up some supply chain related issues as well. Um, and this this was a topic that actually came up this morning in a discussion of parametrics that um, supply chains and non damage business interruption could also be opportunities in ILS. Um, do, do, you, do you agree with that? Yeah, totally agree. Uh, and uh, uh, Apologies, I wasn't able to dial into the uh, the parametric panelling a bit early in my time. But the uh, what I would say is, uh, non damage BI is a product we're really excited about, and um, I, I think the the take up rate of that, you know, it's it's probably a bit early in in that set of discussions to, to expect more. But I think take up rate a little bit less, uh, a little bit less than we would have envisioned by this point. But I think the product makes you know great sense. And so it's just, you know, it's an education thing where we, we make sure we, as an industry, and there's enough education around the product that we're covering uh, the types of companies affected by, you know, those types of supply chain issues. Um, and, and I would even say, you know, you know, pandemic is, is going to come back into this marketplace. And so I, I, I don't, I think we're, we're still, you know, relatively bullish that there is a place for pandemic risk in the ILS market. It will obviously be a smaller component of, of the ILS market than than the property market, but there still is fundamentally a place, you know, for that type of cover. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, the, uh, the pandemic question at the moment, obviously there's a lot of, um, a lot of talk about different facilities and structures and whether it's insurable or uninsurable. Um, but again, that's something that perhaps ILS capital alongside well-structured parametrics and, and as you mentioned, transparency of data is going to be key um, with any peril like that as well. Um, moving on to you, you were you discussed sidecars and you mentioned um, sort of a, a bit of a decline in investor interest. We've got a question from the audience asking: Is that is that really related to trap collateral? Um, and I guess I would add to that: uh, Have you seen um, the challenges with sidecars accelerate since COVID as well? Yeah, so I would say the um, the trap collateral is is always an issue, but probably not fundamentally the issue that's affecting sidecar performance. Um, I think the the nature of the the investment or or sort of the illiquidity of of sidecars, I think is is held it back a, a bit. Um, but I also think at the end of the day, the the portfolios largely have felt similar. And so there there hasn't been as much, um, diversification opportunities, you know, for for the investors to come into sidecar transactions because, in a syndicated property cat market, um, the portfolios can feel the same. And so I think it's it's um, where again going back to some of the points I made on the slide, where we see opportunity is when we have either sort of a, just a portfolio that's just different, diversifying. Uh, miles out well, you know, however you would say has distinctive or unique characteristics. I think those kind of portfolios will continue to to be supported and and really kind of offer diversification to the market um, that it hasn't seen before. But there are just so many other ways to participate in, um, you know, kind of U.S. risk as an example. The having a, a U.S. risk heavy sidecar. You know, once once an investor is invested in that, the question is, what's the what's the relative attractiveness to have another portfolio come in that that looks and, and, and feels the same? So, I think it's more of how can the sidecar market innovate so that the portfolio construction and so what's being brought to market actually looks and feels a little bit differently as we move from one sponsor to the next. That's where I think the opportunity sits in Asia because of fundamentally the, the sort of the different type of portfolio that, that's out there. Great, thank you, Paul. So we have a question related to um, life business, which is a slightly different topic. Um, are, you, are you seeing interest at the moment in the ILS market for life and health structured risks? Um, and is this another area that you would expect to see um, some activity in Asia in the future? So certainly, uh, I think it's a, 
It's uh, it's certainly an opportunity. Where, where we have struggled is um, you know finding the, the, the sort of the sweet spot in the market around life and health deals that makes sense to you know create these risk transfer types of transactions, um, and, and and so I think significant interest on, on both sides of the trade, if you will. Um, but we, we've just sort of struggled to find that sweet spot where that, that, that trade makes economic sense. So I think there's always interest to, to grow life and health business. I think uh, certainly make the same arguments uh, as we have on everything else that, you know, life health risk out of Asia, uh, I think would be received, you know, really well. Um, it's just kind of question of can we, can we make the economics work? And then as you kind of look at then the extrapolation of life and health is kind of mortality and excess mortality and things like that. You know, whether it's a true pandemic cover or whether it you know, covers a lot of things, including pandemics, um, you know, I think that, again, I think that that capacity is going to be out there. It's just um, it's just going to be how, how do we create a trade that, uh, that both sides and, you know, of that trade, if you will, feel comfortable with. All right. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the, the investor side of the equation, you talked about the potential for growth in terms of obviously seeded risk um, in Asia Pacific, but on the investor side, do you expect to see more capital coming to the ILS market from the region as well? Um, and we also have a question from the audience, which is along these lines, in that can you give a brief overview on the type of investors you see and how they deploy capital, the investor base in Asia? Yeah, sure. So I, I would say the fundamentally we believe the asset class is going to attract more capital, and, and, and fundamentally we believe you know some of that is going to come out of, out of Asia Pacific. Asia Pacific already participates as investors in this, and really important investors in some in some regards um, to the space. I, I think we envision more. So in a you know as we just look at the the relative performance of ILS compared to other asset strategies we continue to believe that that is uh, you know fundamentally an attractive place to to attract capital and especially in in kind of prolonged um, low interest rate environments you know prolonged kind of negative interest rate environments the, the attractiveness of ILS, I think, is even more pronounced. So fundamentally, out of, out of Asia Pacific, um, you know, we see capital coming out of, out of Japan. We see capital coming out of Singapore. We see capital coming out of Australia, New Zealand. Um, you know, we, we expect more. Um, you know, we are in a number of conversations ourselves with, with investors in those regions. I think it's, it's still viewed as a little bit of an esoteric asset class. And so I think there's a little bit more education involved with it. Um, but I think when when we can actually have those in-depth discussions and and now, you know, now that we're an asset class that's that's 20 years old, um, there's more data to support kind of what the track record looks like. Um, we are certainly also, also interested, we're, we're in a very interesting point in the market and you might characterize it as a little bit more of an opportunistic you know, point in the marketplace as far as investors bringing new capacity into the marketplace. And so I think, I think timing is actually you know, pretty good for, for more capital to, to flow in. We're, we're still seeing um, you know, pension funds represent a you know, larger percentage of the overall capital coming into the space. You know, we, we wouldn't really anticipate that, that changing anytime soon. Capital coming in from from sovereigns, endowments, foundations, you know, things like that, still still quite important. High net worth markets still important, depending on where where that capital comes in across across the globe. Um, but fundamentally, it's it's the pension market that's that's really allocating uh, uh, capacity to the marketplace. That's really going to fundamentally change the, the capacity dynamics. And mostly deploying. <laughs> Deploying through dedicated ILS funds. So I think yeah. So I think the the ILS managers still are largely the beneficiaries of the capital coming into the marketplace. There are more and more that you know are you know, either have started to put their toe in the water in terms of investing directly, um, or you know contemplate doing so in the future. But especially as we think about the the, the pension space, more of that. You know, 
for lots of reasons inherent to the pension industry. And more of that's gonna go through, man be deployed through managers than, than directly. But, but, but there are exceptions and some of those exceptions are meaningful and, and we, we see kind of a number of those exceptions, you know, kind of slowly growing, but, but growing over time. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we've got time for one final quick question. Um, do, you, do you see any potential barriers to ILS activity in Singapore and Hong Kong um, to the growth of it? Um, is, and is there sufficient infrastructure in the region yet to support sustained growth of the uh, localized ILS markets? I suppose that's also a question of there's work to do to make sure that it can be supported as well. Yeah, so, so great question, and, and and hopefully you know there was a little bit of color that I provided on that. I think you know for the domiciles that are just starting up, the um, the uh, the infrastructure has been by definition. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to be I'm losing my connection, so I'm going to be typing in a little bit here. But um, the uh, the infrastructure has been building as the business builds, and so I think that is to be expected. And you know was expected, um, and so I'd say, are are these new domiciles at you know kind of a run rates in terms of servicing the industry? I think the answer is you know not quite, or it's still building. Uh, I think Singapore, with the amount of activity they've had over the last couple of years, I think that's building and 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 sort of the, the capabilities building there. You know, Hong Kong will, will go through a growth period if they decide that they're actually going to enact this type of legislation. So I think we just have to anticipate that there is a period of time where, um, you know, all the constituents, all the parties to a transaction understand, you know, that it may not be as as quick and as efficient in, in going to, uh, you know, to a different domicile that's more established. Uh, but I think that the infrastructure will build as the, as the business builds. And so I think that and that just seems like a natural kind of expectation that we would have here. Um, and it's not, you know, listen, I think, you know, the efficiency and for frequent issuers and the attractiveness of doing something you know, very quick and efficient and things like that, I, th I think there's still a lot of value there. So there's, there's no means does the local domicile strategy detract from anything else that's, that's more global in nature. But I do believe that to, to grow business, especially in Asia, to be able to trade locally, to be able to, to be in the same time zone, to be able to understand the regulatory framework, um, and 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 even some of the sort of the political pressures associated with some of those things, it, it's it's just vital that um, you know Singapore continues to grow and, and that Hong Kong and others continue to uh, to think about coming into the marketplace. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, Really appreciate your time today. I appreciate you uh, participating in the conference. Um, thank you very much. And thank you Thanks. to everybody who watched today. Um, you will be able to access a on-demand replay of this if you came in halfway through. Thank you for the questions, those who submitted them. Um, we'll be back on Monday with um, two sessions on Monday, one on Life ILS um, and the potential there in Asia and then a keynote later in the day featuring Tom Johansmeyer from PCS. Um, so thank you for watching today. Um, all of the links will be available for you to view on demand um, using the same login credentials you've used for these sessions. Paul, thanks once again. Um, hope to catch up with you soon once we're allowed to travel and meet more freely. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Great to be here.